the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. My name is Joan Finkelstein. I'm the director of the Dance Center here at the 92nd Street Y. Uh, for those who, of you who aren't familiar with our center, I, I'm going to tell you briefly what we do here. We teach classes in styles ranging from modern and ballet to Isadora and Afro-Caribbean to about 800 uh, adults and children of varying levels from be beginner through professional. We um, produce two informal performance series, Sundays at 3 and Fridays at noon. We house the Harkness Space Grant Program, which provides rehearsal space for the creation of new work by professional choreographers. Uh, we run the Harkness Workshop Series for professional dancers. David Parsons has been teaching this week and will be teaching next week. Um, leading choreographers teach professional dancers classes in technique and repertory. Uh, we have parties every Saturday night, so please come in international folk dance and ballroom dance. And we try to use our programs as vehicles for outreach whenever we can. Tonight it is my extreme pleasure to welcome you to our first of three Breaking Ground lectures. It has been about 10 years since the Y hosted this kind of speaking forum for dancers and choreographers. And we have the generosity and foresight of Helene Geismar Katz, the director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning, to thank for making this series possible for us to do. I feel most fortunate that Deborah Jowett agreed to lead these discussions. Deborah's work as a critic has always been attuned to the process of creating dance. She has been a dancer and choreographer. She, in fact, shared a program here at the Y many years ago with John Wilson. Uh, and so she sort of knows dance from the inside. She's also been a teacher and historian, and of course you know her as a critic uh, for the Village Voice. And I feel that the dance world is lucky to have had such a compassionate exponent. I will let Deborah tell you more about our first guests, but I, I have to say that I'm so excited that they are Mr. Eric Hawkins and his longtime musical collaborator, Lucia Dlugazewski, because half a lifetime ago, and I won't tell you how many years that is, I was introduced to Hawkins' technique, and it utterly transformed my dancing and informed my entire dance career. That he's here at the Y, where he performed over 40 years ago, is just thrilling to me. And so, without further ado, I introduce to you Ms. Deborah Jowett. I'm only out here for a minute uh, to introduce a short excerpt uh, from a video by Eric Hawkins that we're going to look at. Um, one of the most notable features of Eric Hawkins' work has been his uh, insistence on using live music and the unusual and beautiful commission scores that have been written for him, many of them by Lucia Lugazhevsky, who is here with him tonight. And one such dance is Cantilever. Now, it's, it's interesting, and perhaps we can ask um, the two of them about this later, that orig originally the score was written for a dance called Cantilever, which premiered in 1963. And years later, in 1988, Eric Hawkins made another dance using the same score called Cantilever II. So now we're going to look at, just so that you get the flavor, those of you that didn't have time to see Killer of Enemies being run outside, so that you get something of the flavor of the choreography in your head, um, we're just going to show a short five-minute excerpt from Cantilever 2, and then I will bring back, bring on Eric Hawkins and Lucia Lukashevsky, and we'll talk.
think that I probably don't need to introduce either of these two people, but I'm going to do it anyway, uh, <laughs> because there might be somebody who doesn't know both of them very well. Um, Eric Hawkins uh, has quite a varied career in dance. He was originally um, a member of George Balanchine's American Ballet. He was uh, a performer with Lincoln Kirstein's Ballet Caravan, where he did, I guess, his first choreography showpiece in 1937. He was a, a very crucial part of Martha Graham's company from 1938 until into the early 50s. And of course, as his, with his own company, he has been a teacher, um, a visionary theorist of dance, and a choreographer of whom Alan Kriegsman has written. He is known as the maker of a still growing body of dance theater works of indelible originality, beauty, and poetic incandescence. And more recently, uh, he's the author of this book, which I happen to have brought with me, The Body is a Clear Place, which I urge you all to read, a series of essays written over the years about dance. And with us is Lucia Dlugaszewski, the composer of the score you've just heard, who is known in the dance world for her sensitive and very startling collaborations with Eric Hawkins uh, since 1952, right? And Openings of the Eye, is that right. the first piece? Um, and who has also served as his musical director, uh, finding other interesting composers to create music for him. And is known in the music world as well as, uh, as an innovative composer uh, whose music, uh, of whose music the music critic Leighton Kerner once said, it breathes a new kind of super oxygen that would burn up the products of most other contemporary choreographers. So uh, I'd, I'd like to start a little bit uh, trying to get both of them to answer some questions um, about the work and about working together. But uh, we were talking a little bit backstage about one thing I thought I would raise to Eric, um, that many choreographers today are very concerned with the violence and the ugliness of civilization and the pain and have made that the subject of their choreography, which is something that Eric Hawkins has never done. Um, and I think he has said that it's not the job of art to report on life as it is. Could you talk a little bit about why, why you feel that way, about uh, what, what the job of art is, if not to report on life? We all want to have abundant life. And There's no person alive who doesn't have to fight uh, a negative attitude. And so I don't see any point in, we all have enough trouble as it is <laughs> in so why compound the, the negativity that there is in our ordinary existence? Everybody's born from his mother. But then the, the job is to bring that life to full blossoming. And so, why is it incumbent on the artist to, to reinforce that, that sadness and that missing of the boat in everybody's life? I think you said once that uh, you believed in art being life affirming rather than life destroying, that to provide some insight into the deeper processes of nature maybe was what you were. Well, I'm very proud of, 
of the killer's enemies that was out in their lobby. Uh, <clears throat> I was born out in Colorado, almost on the New Mexico line. It was a wonderful place, wonderful place to be born. And uh, very soon, I began to know something about the Indians who lived in the Hopis and the Navajos and the Apaches. And uh, we don't have a, an easy access to our myths in America today. We don't, our families don't tell us myths. And by myths, I don't mean something that's false. But a myth, a myth is something that, that puts in other terms, in a metaphor, really, how, how you maintain life. And uh, so, <coughs> knowing the, gradually when I began to learn the, the, the myths of the Hopis and the Navajos, I began to see, that there, it's published in the uh, Bureau of Eth Ethnology in Washington, and the when some people began to translate it into English. And I found that they are really, they, they simply want their young people, the men and the women, to grow up having a full life. So I took that uh, killer of enemies and uh, used it as a basis for a dance. And uh, it was commissioned by Kennedy Center, and uh, we've done it over the country. But the reason I speak of that is that it's, it's one more way of having images of how you integrate the personality because it's possible for people to have taken a wrong turning. Haven't you ever watched somebody who's, who's homeless and, and very disturbed out on the street and you say to yourself, what happened to that person that they made such a wrong turning that they didn't just have didn't have some kind of faith that uh, life was going to be good to them and that they could use their own power. And so my, f my feeling is that the artist needs to reinforce the the way we grow up. Th those myths that you have returned to, the ancient Greeks, um, classical, uh, pre, actually pre-classical mythology, uh, the, the Native American dances that, themes that have entered your work, and also in things, in dances like um, Eight Clear Places and Black Lake, um, I feel that there's a very strong connection with nature, with the powers of nature. The, the, the characters in Killer of Enemies are forces of nature. And so how, how do you feel about that, um, that connection with nature that you have as a choreographer? What, how, how does that reinforce your ideas? We're, we're all part of nature. Yes. 
So. Uh, to to not have any difference between the intellect and the natural body. That's why the title of the book, The Body's a Clear Place. Mm -hmm. And so we've all had to have fight uh, our tendency in the Western world to think the body is dirty. And, and that's what that's that wants to represent the bodies as pure. I still remember in, in uh, high school, no, I mean in Sunday school, I do remember it said the body, uh, no, how's the thing? The body is God's holy temple. Well, to, I, I began to, to realize uh, like, like reading Kumar Swami and people like that, there is, there is no difference between secular and sacred. And so one of the reasons that, that I was influenced very much at the time of, of Hickler Places was getting to know uh, the thought of Zen Buddhism. And they they have a very clear clear relationship to the natural world, and so that's why, uh, let's say, Eichler places is uh, is using metaphors mm -hmm. of how you do in dance. In one dance in, in them in is called pine tree. Well, how do you dance a pine tree? It's a solo for a man. I did it myself. Wish I could do it today. <laughs> and uh, we perp we perp every once in a while when, when we go down to uh, uh, Hunter College to rehearse. I realize how in '60, uh, Lucy and I did the eight places. my thought just now. But the, well, the, 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 the use of the metaphor. Oh, the metaphor. Yes. Was the pine tree. Yes. You know, oh, yes, a pine tree. How do you dance a pine tree? Well, let me say to you, I've come back to that. The last time we did that was at the Guggenheim Museum. I don't remember where, what year. In, in the middle 70s. Yes. Lucy, pull your microphone a little closer. In the better? Beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to be saying no, anything. No, you're supposed you know. to yes, say yeah. Yeah. I just saw it's, uh, So, it's only through metaphor that you can, the costume and the movement, that you can show that this pine tree. And so, I've come back to that dance now a number of times. Uh, I did some photographs uh, some time ago, and I just, re to get that ready, uh, went into a, rehearsed a little bit. But all I can tell you is that uh, the metaphor of the, of the movement in the pine tree, I think it works. I think it works. Yeah. I was uh, going to ask Lucy, and I think that this, um, Eric's approach to nature in these pieces or to human nature in a work like Of Love mm. has a, a very delicate, sensuous quality. Mm. And I wondered, in, in, in some of these, you've actu you actually uh, not only used new kinds of sonorities, but created instruments that would reflect that. Could you talk a little bit about pine tree and that kind of thing in music? Well, uh, I, I think I could say it most clearly. Is this okay now? Yeah. I feel like a rock star. I should be caressing it, you know, caressing it all. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, um, 
I was absolutely thrilled when I saw Eric's choreography, and, and, and when we collaborated then, uh, he did the choreography first, and I did the music afterward. Um, and I felt that the innocence, the purity, the egolessness of his choreography in Eight Clear Places was so intense and so perfect that every time I thought of a conventional instrument that had pitches, and I don't know if any of you have ever thought about it before, but uh, if you put one pitch next to another pitch, you get an interval. And the minute you get an interval in music, and that's one of its big functions, is it creates emotion. And human emotion, uh, nothing wrong with it, but very often it interferes with a kind of egoless purity of seeing the natural world. Um, and so I just felt I would always be in the way if I used those instruments. And so that's the reason. I'm not, um, I'm not a tinkerer. I'm, I'm more a thinker type. Uh, and so I wouldn't have gone ahead inventing these instruments if I didn't feel such a um, conceptual need for finding um, just the sound for its own sake without this emotional baggage that I didn't want at that time. And so then, as a result, and of course, Eric, all, Eric's an empiricist, and I plan in advance. I think it's as, as a um, self-defense, because he, as an empiricist, started with one dance, and then he went into another, and then he went into another. The end result was something was an hour long. And you know, if you're going to be involved in a time experience an hour long, you have to um, keep the interest, you have to keep the attention going. And so as a result, I invented about 100 percussion instruments because each dance had its own little choir of instruments. And so I loved all that very much. Then I guess it was in uh, 86, is it in 86 that you first asked me to do? Uh, Eric, we, I, I sort of helped Eric uh, find um, a group of instruments together uh, so that we could afford live music. And so we, we have seven instruments, and I swear if the composer is resourceful and imaginative, we can make that sound like an orchestra. And so I think by now we're the only group that is still hanging in there on the side of the angels with live music. But he he wanted um, yes that deserves a, that deserves applause. Uh, he wanted uh, the logistics of those hundred percussion instruments were becoming a headache for him, and he thought also when you pay musicians to play, you want them to play the whole evening, uh, and so if there's a long work that they're not playing. Um, what, what is the word? It's not cost effective. Anyway, um, he asked me if I were willing to try to write a score. Because you see, um, you couldn't. People say, oh, you're orchestrating eight your places. That's the whole point. You couldn't, or or quote, orchestrate the suchness. Of, they're irreducible. It's like the shivering of a piece of paper. It's. Um, and Eric didn't go into this as much as I think it'd be useful to go into. The reason for all this, um, the reason the Zen Buddhism is such an exciting point of view um, is that I think it's the only spiritual doctrine that has been able, through the, idea, th through the oriental idea of paradox, to bring uh, very profound opposites together into harmony. And the very profound opposite, you know, when you say, well, so much of Western religion sometimes will veer into saying that the body is dirty. There's a very good reason for that. Uh, the body dies. And the fact that we die is an is a unspeakable situation. And so all kinds of cultures have worked very hard to 
to process that into something that was bearable. But the Zen Buddhists, as far as I can tell, are the only ones that have not speculated about this. They just took what is and they went into the actual psychology of the human mind and found that if you think in a certain way, um, you can have what, what I guess I could call a, a deep aesthetic experience. And when you have a deep aesthetic experience, that is not an emotional experience, but an aesthetic experience, uh, you achieve a momentary enlightenment or nirvana. You achieve momentary eternity. And that is, that is their great contribution. And so... Uh, um, you know, when I, I, I was, didn't mean to interrupt, but I no. just thought that the thinking of the, the music that you had written, I, I think it was Eight Clear Places, but maybe not, and a Zen experience of feeling so struck by watching the dance and seeing the musician at the same time oh, because yes. she was on stage. <laughs> and all of a sudden, in my mind, I still see this, picking up a big sheet of white paper and just ripping it. And at that moment, I really thought, I'm seeing the music, I'm hearing the dance. Beautiful, Deborah, you're beautiful, yeah. absolutely. We did that, um, that, that we did in 80, 63 or 64 in Paris. And at that time, I was very young and very idealistic about Cocteau and all those wonderful French poets and all, and I assumed that the audience would be full of such people when we were in Paris. <laughs> well, in sixty in sixty three, it was a strictly bourgeois Parisian audience, and there I was kneeling on, and you know, because because I was a happening and I was a performance artist long before anyone codified those terms. Because I, I was I was the happening and I sat there and and kneeled and and started to tear the paper and there was whistling and stamping on the ground and I thought to myself, should I stop? And then I thought, well would Cocteau stop? No, he would stop. So I went on and I, I did it. So um I, and that that I, I is going to remain still in in the in the oh, score, good. Good. because that was so uh, well. Uh, I I think um, Eric didn't use the word suchness, but it's it's a this is the Zen Buddhist word. It's the th you know uh, Suzanne Sontag wrote a book called uh, Against Interpretation. Interpretation. Yeah, and she she picked up on this. Uh, partly, I think, more because she was interested in Artaud. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he was also, it, it's curious, he called it thusness. Then James Joyce called it quiditas. And, and the Zen Buddhists call it suchness. And this wonderful one Zen Buddhist um, monk named Hui Ning, who's one of my favorites, um, he calls it thus come. And he's the one that when he was doing his, um, and the reason I tell you this is, I think this story, this, these are in, in, ineffable ideas, but they're so powerful that they affect the way I do sound. And the, Eric talked about metaphor. Well, other people do metaphors, but they're not like Eric's metaphors. I think Eric has also talked, used the word immediacy. That's it, that's it, that's the word, that's the word. That's the Zen, that's the Zen Buddhist word. And it's, and it's very difficult it's very thrilling, but it's very difficult to live in immediacy and to create art in immediacy. But when you hit it, it's absolutely fabulous. And uh, so that word suchness, uh, I, the paper was, was a suchness. Yes. It was, it's irreducible. It's just in and for itself. Like the movement, the pine tree movement. Oh, absolutely. And you remember he has the red sleeve yeah. in the pine tree? Well, that, I, that's what I'd like to talk about because it's that disparate element, which again, the Zen Buddhists understood that so well. They felt that, um, you've heard of the Zen Buddhist koan. What is a koan? A koan is, you've heard of uh, J.D. Salinger's talking about the sound of one hand clapping. Absurd, absurd remark. Uh, they throw these absurd remarks at their novices to to put their 
their ordinary, everyday, common sense thinking off balance because that common sense thinking, uh, uh, what's the word, deprives them uh, of uh, an even deeper kind of experience which is experiencing directly in immediacy. And so Eric has, <coughs> <clears throat> Eric has always, in his costumes and in his choreography, he's always brought in what he calls the disparate element. And the disparate element into the metaphor is what creates that, that, um, that koan of off balance. And so let me just finish this little speech with that story of Hui Ning, because when he was in essence, he was doing his doctoral orals in the Zen Buddhist monastery, and they had them all lined up, and he was the one that they, everyone thought was the dummy. And so the, the, not, the, the abbot said to all of them, now, here is a picture. Tell me what you could do or say about this picture that would make it not a picture. And the other uh, novices were very bright and they talked about the implications of the whole cosmos and the inner realities and all these things and Hui Ning who stuttered a lot and never could get any word out easily, they got to him and they all sort of thought, oh well he's not going to know what to do. And he didn't say a word, he just went to the picture and he turned it on its side. Well, have you, can you imagine a picture that's supposed to stand upright because it's supposed to pour stuff? You turn it on its side, it's no longer a picture. And there's a place in, I don't know if you remember, Deborah, but I'm sure you do because you love this sort of thing so much because it's in your own choreography. That's why I'm a fan of that part. Um, in, in a dance called uh, Summer Thunder, Eric had a paper costume, black, and at the very end of it, again, the metaphor, he threw his arms out and it made a great big thunderous sound and that's quite obvious, okay. Then the paper got on the ground, it was no longer thunder. Then he picked it up and he just carried it out and there's a wonderful picture of him where it's, no, it's like the picture on its side, it's no longer the paper, it's no longer the costume, he's just carrying out this sheet of paper and it's, it's become, become the sheet of paper. So, I mean, as I say, this is something which I love very much, so I could talk to you about it by the hour, but I think I made my point, so. I was, I was gonna ask Eric about choreographing Cantilever two to the same music you'd used for Cantilever. Why, why did you do that, and what, what was uh, the difference? Because I had enough people to, to enlarge it. And I didn't want to write another Cantilever two. <laughs> so because I'll tell you, uh, when I wrote Cantilever two, when I wrote Cantilever, it was when all the other modern, or not all, but a great many modern successful choreographers were suddenly turning to Baroque music. And here was I tearing my paper and all that, and here were they coming with all these wonderful Bach things that were so richly going around. And Eric would look at me and say, and I don't have this kind of music, and, and I felt as I say, at that time I was very young and wanted to please so badly, and so I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to write something like Bach. But on the other hand, I thought, what is it that, that pleases us so? It's a certain motor grandeur. And so I thought, obviously that's a valid hunger that, that our culture has, and how could I give him that and still maintain my vision of contemporary music. And so can the, the score of Cantilever, I, I, I made it like, well, I call it four attention spans, and one is like this very trembling cloth of gold, which, which of course is wonderful in buoying up that energy, so that's why. And I, I, one of those composed <laughs> in a lifetime for me was enough, so. I see. Well, Eric, speaking again about movement, I, I was curious that you said uh, in, in one of the things you wrote that the best dancing that you think you'd ever seen was non-Western, was Shanta Rao and other performers. What is it that non-Western performers have had for you that even the greatest of our Western ones don't?
Well, I, I go back to what I said earlier. Uh, they think of the dance art as sacred. Always, yeah. Mm -hmm. That it's that it's it's not entertainment, but is on the on the. You, you, they might they might say or you might say it's at the service of the gods mm -hmm. and uh, what we mean by that is that it's a it's a it's to reinforce our own maturity mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's but the, serious but the naturally the Bratinatya that Shantarao did is very old and I sometimes despair <coughs> in, in, having, <coughs> in having having enough time or even in my lifetime to have investigated the the uh, the complexity of their of their rhythm mm -hmm. uh, I from a book by Fobian Bowers, he called The Dance in India. Uh, we don't even have a word for a subdivision of a pulse. But, uh, so I use the word, I use it in classes all the time, uh, from the Hindu, called matra. It simply means a subdivision of a pulse. And you can, div you can divide it into too many subdivisions you want to. But, but we're so dumb that we don't even have a word for it. It's, a, <laughs> it's the same way that in the Western world, we don't have the word hara. Which means? And all I can tell you is that I've arrived at this notion that that is the center of the body. It's 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 the pelvis and the low trunk. And uh, I took me a long time to disagree with Isadora Duncan. That she talked here. about there, the uh, right here. Yes, yeah. and maybe she's talking about something else. <laughs> uh, she's talking about an emotional center here. Yes, but I think. The word hara means the structural center of the body. It didn't have anything to do with the motion, but it's just the, the, the center of the body and you, you move from that there. you can move. Is that and the same as and the from, from controlling that, uh, you, could do, you could do anything well. And is that the same as chi? The Chinese. I don't know that it is or not. I, it may, Probably may, if it's, you're putting in the somewhere same place. Near, yeah. Generally in the same place. Because this is Japanese. This is, uh, this, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Once I was talking to my lawyer's office, uh, in my uh, lawyer's office, and uh, he said, have you ever heard of Aikido? And I said, no. And he said, well, let me send you a book about it. And so it was a, it was a book that explained what is Aikido, and now, I don't, later on, I realize that it's a very old uh, concept uh, that this is the center of the body. And once I remember, well, that's too long a story to tell you. <laughs> but did, did you ever do martial arts like a No, no, I've never Just done it. Just read about it. I, I wish I could had done, but there's only so much time to do anything. <laughs> so I haven't gone to it. But on the other hand, the very fact that that is the concept, it, it tied in with what I had already explored myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, you live and learn. I know you've, 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 uh, you've written some very, uh, and spoken in class, some very meaningful things about tight muscles not being able to feel and I think those ideas are very compatible with not perhaps with Bharatanatyam but with Aikido and Tai Chi. Right. 
the idea of the limbs moving freely from the center? Yes. Uh, I did my first concert here at the Y in 1940. <laughs> Many people did their first concerts here at the Y. <laughs> it was very hospitable and quite inexpensive, and although they did fine you if the curtain went up more than five minutes late. <laughs> Did they, Eric? You? No. no they, they, uh, Maybe that was later. <laughs> but what I wanted to say is, I've, I've, I've been very lucky to have had a long experience in dancing. Uh, the last thing I did was, I guess, it was last year, wasn't it? I, I did a performance of Death Is a Hunter there. Yeah. But uh, so I've been on the search to try to know what the truth is, and I'm very grateful that I had four years with Balanchine. He was a wonderful man. But on the other hand, there are lots of places that he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't have this experience. <coughs> and uh, so my job out of my interest was to come to bring that all together. And so the reason that I spe speak about the, the Chanterelle I almost think it was, it was a concert here at the, at the Y. That you saw her? Yeah. Yes. This was a very great uh, Indian performer, Shantarao, who came here in the 50s, I believe, maybe even earlier. And did, uh, uh, did later, later in the, uh, about the 60s. That late? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. She was one of the first really extraordinary Bharatanatyam soloists. And yeah. very beautiful, uh, to physically, come, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, th uh, there were quite a few around that time, mm -hmm. but... Uh, but she was outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, you, you, um, I know you kinesthesia is something you feel very strongly about and you, you said something wonderful once about uh, that audiences, you couldn't, you couldn't go to a dance, you, you couldn't listen to music with cotton in your ears and you couldn't go to a dance concert with cotton in your body, that you had to be able to be sensitive to the movement. How d is the kind of movement you make, that is your style, your choices, um, somehow aimed at getting the audience to respond, to feel physically, rather than to say batter them with some kind of movement? Do you think about their responses? Well, that's, that's what you mean by sensuousness. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's not just the performers, it's how the audience feels. Yes, it. but it's also uh, it's not having an ego maniac, maniac. Yeah. Oops. Uh, uh, the, uh, right. Uh, well, well when, when you're egoless, you don't dominate your audience. Of course, people enjoy being dominated in a way. But, um, <laughs> but the thing is that, that there, is a, there is a larger enjoyment. Uh, and and Shanta Rao, just the, when you dance for the gods, that gives that that's a that's a mythic way of permitting yourself to be egoless. But it, it, it seems know? to me also, though, it's not there too. It was always a sensuous touch. It wasn't just a you know, it's, this is a bag of potatoes and I'm going to hoist it, and or or the way you do feel sometimes with athletes, where they're they're so their whole um, emphasis is so strongly on the spectacle of what they can do that that sensuous contact is forgotten, is forgotten in but a way. I, th I think it's a difference in kind, too, because mm -hmm. there's no doubt that audiences feel s a certain kind of kinesthetic sense when um, a male ballet dance dancer jumps extraordinarily oh, it's high beautiful. or an yeah, athlete yeah. does a feat. Yeah. But this is a, a, a different, a more subtle, perhaps, mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of kinesthesia. I just wondered if it was possible to work for something like that, he or does, whether it's yeah. just a byproduct of what you do. 
No, you do work for it. You, you, you do work uh, right in the technique. Well, that's right in the in the technique. You try to have ideas that that will train the body to do everything, mm -hmm. but without showmanship. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a dangerous word. When you're on the stage, it has to be a kind of showmanship. Showmanship. But on the other hand, if it's if it's if it's ego, if it's not in the aesthetic experience, but in the egotistical experience, it's that's good. Uh, Maritain has a wonderful saying: uh, "Virtuosity is an escape for the artist." Mm -hmm. That if you just try to be virtuoso, look at a pianist or up here, his heart would sell whether he's trying to show off or whether he's really getting the essence of the music. Thinking deeply about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. do, do you think of yourself as, as Apollonian or Dionysian, or both? Both. Uh, <laughs> well, it just happened that the place where I was born in, in Trinidad, Colorado, is the exact place between the Apollonian uh, Indians down in New Mexico and Arizona, and the Plains Indians up in uh, the rest of Kansas and, and Colorado, and up through all the way into uh, to the east. Uh, They're Dionysian? They are, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Then, then you have to go by the wonderful synthesis that Nietzsche talks about. He said in the in his the birth of tragedy, the, the the you need the Dionysian and the Apollonian together. Yes, that's right. That's that right. makes the whole that those are the possibilities, and therefore the whole range of a full art. So you need that calmness and also that wildness. That's Absolutely. Right. It's very interesting that Isadora Duncan, who's, who, who said that, that Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music was her Bible. Well, it's, it's uh, the greatest thing he ever did, and he did that when he was in yes. his early 20s. And, and yeah. I think all her first uh, Greek dances were very um, uh, gentle, mm -hmm. peaceful, um, the dance of the blessed spirits, uh, mm -hmm. the reconciliation of Eurydice, and then when she read Nietzsche, she began to explore the Furies and that uh -huh. dark side. So mm -hmm. it's possible, I, I mean, to I guess for you to explore that wildness without exploring it in what you would think of as a life-destroying or well, negative that's, way. That's the problem, and that's what Nietzsche understood, is that if you just have Dionysian, it'll tear itself up. But if you have just Apollonian, you have beauty, but but it's Pretty lifeless. Boring, yeah. It's lifeless, and so you need the two together. Um, it's it's as if the Apollonian builds a, a little beautiful house around this Dionysian flame, so mm -hmm. it can it can maintain itself mm -hmm. because it does tear. Uh, I think one kind of aspect of the jazz is that it's it's so totally Dionysian that it tears itself up, tears tears the artists up too. They kind of fall apart too, because uh, it, it's just so it's so extreme, and it doesn't have that. F it, well, it doesn't have form. That's what form is. Form is the Apollonian. Now, your music. I was thinking you were talking about of love, and mm -hmm. Lucy, your music for of love was very hot music. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> um, well, that was the one, right, with the four musicians? Oh, they, 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 yes, I, I did the thing in space, yeah, where I had the trumpet player come, come from the back holding one note and making a crescendo coming right up, right up into, yeah, that, that was It was nice. very extraordinary because there were these, I mean, tones that were so piercing and mm -hmm. so... Well, brass, it was a brass quintet. And yet yeah. they were very... Um, controlled in, in time, I hope so, so maybe yeah. that's that mm -hmm. Apollonian yeah, right. Dionysian. I think, I, I think maybe by temperament I, I take more chances into the Dionysian, but I, I'm very aware of how it must be, uh, how it must be uh, um, 
uh, I, I also take tremendous chances in form. I think form is a wonderful thing. I don't mean cliched form and boring form, but just the idea of forming. There are just so many, so many um, wonderful things that, that a time art can do that makes you kind of like a, a celestial architect because you can, if you're a time artist, you can create such dangerous edifices that, that a, a real architect, the thing would collapse, but you can fly. I think real architects dream of flying, but they know how far they can go. But a, a time artist, like a dancer or a composer, you can make these architectures that, that really fly or soar or hover or what all those well, things. Now, it, it's said that in the days of the Bauhaus school in Germany, that Walter Gropius encouraged the theater people to make these extraordinary constructions that they uh -huh. did because there was no money to build real buildings. So, oh, so they, they were could... experimenting with an architectural uh -huh. sense in another uh -huh. way. I know. I, I, I wanted to ask Eric uh, something we haven't mentioned, and I think in just a minute we should let the audience ask questions, about the dancers themselves. Do, do you, um, how much they contribute now to what you do in, in terms of um, showing you movement or responding to movement because, as you said, sometimes you, you don't, want, don't do some of the movement anymore. Well, uh, always, always before, I used to get up and do, and do, the, do the movement myself. But later on, after I had my stroke a few years ago, uh, I didn't have this uh, same energy to get up, and so I have a wonderful group of people right now who've uh, who've who've been trained, and who understand, and who can make uh, a wonderful contribution by by something that I can direct. But but Lucia also uh, has taught for a number of years. I was we were down at. Uh, American University, and I was getting ready for a performance with the with the National Symphony, and so I said, Lucia, would you teach the composition class? And so Lucy, Lucy said, and and telling you about that, I forgot. Louis, the, movement. About the, the movement, the dancers. Oh, dancers. yes. Yes, uh, in developing the students to, to let something come out of whole cloth, out of their own sensibility, so they didn't have to repeat anything that they had known. They just let it well up. And so... Uh, Someday you maybe you'll see a demonstration of the composition class, and so the people have gone through that, and so they, they help me very greatly now. And you you've always been wonderful at giving images and in well, words that's it. that he they does. can respond to, and everybody is is absolutely um, well. In my classes, we always go into fearlessly into the disparate element and into alternate thinking and into uh, that sense of freshness, as well as uh, getting back to that sense of suchness we talk about in anchor places. Uh, I think the one thing that, you know, there's been in the Judson movement, uh, there was the, I think it came from oh, other artists talking about Zen Buddhism as, as not separating everyday life from mm -hmm. from um, art, and that is another thing as Zen Buddhism. But what was unfortunate when the Justin people took it over, they made it task dances, and task dances are the very are that ordinary um, language communication that the that the Zen masters are trying to catch you off balance with, and so. Um, if you go back into that and do a task and, then, and do that common sense kind of thing, um, 
you need somebody with a co-ed to kind of shake it up. And it's, it, it, it's not the right interpretation if you're thinking of that Zen Buddhist uh, purity of thought. It, it's perfectly all right to do it. It's a kind of dance. But uh, so uh, I guess what made me think about that is um, the Japanese tea ceremony, which in essence is a task. You do a task, but the whole point is that you take a task, and the and then um, oh, how can I say? This? When, when, no, no. When you when you do a task, you usually don't experience in immediacy because you have the goal. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm going to clean up the the room. I'm going to whatever, I'm going to build a house, whatever I'm going to do. And so it's the goal that you're thinking about, the, the end of the task. What the Zen Buddhist is talking about when it says everyday life is that you take the task and then the every moment of the time you're doing that task, you're supposed to be thinking in immediacy. And that's what makes the tea ceremony, you see. If you, do, if you did a tea ceremony the way we usually drink tea, you know, drink it and mindlessly and, you know. But, you know, you, you, first of all, you, walk, you watch the way the tea master walks in. And Rikyu was the first one, this great Rikyu. So when I try to get myself excited about my music, I have it on the wall I wrote down. This sound should be the way Rikyu walks, mm -hmm. and which means, you know, now I am walking, now I am walking. Well, that's not the way you cross the street, no. you know, in New York City. But that is immediacy, and so it, it, that is that wonderful fine point. And so with Eric, he never, he, 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 he's, he's always trying, both in his dance technique and in his choreography, and, and when he watches, say, if someone, he says, now nah, I want an alternate thinking, I want you to do thus, thus, so if someone does it, he's always looking for that sense of immediacy, that's, that, and, and that, that's, that, you know, that's right in there. There is one thing that I would like to, to get across to you folks who are here. Um, it's a, it's a most important aesthetic formulation in all of Western thought, and I think if if you get begin to get a clue of it, I think it will reveal something to you. Uh, naturally, I'm taking this from F. S. C. Northup's uh, *The Meeting of East and West*. It's not just in that book, but it's it's clearly stated there. Art in its first function is just seeing the uh, the 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 action, the the uh, not the, the action, the materials, the material, the material for their own sake. Yes, just for their own sake. Their own beauty. And that is a very wonderful thing, because having having put your emphasis on just the the thought of the movement or the music or whatever, of, of painting, for example, or poetry even. You just have an immediacy of experience. And then art in its second function is when you use those immediate uh, materials, the sounds, the movement, to convey something else that's not on this stage, then that's where Northrop comes through uh, in a very meaningful way. Then you have to give only the truth. And the truth is what you know by, by the wise men of any time or any period what, what, uh, what I'm very troubled by today, to leave this other aspect, what I'm very troubled by today is why more people are not on the side of life. It's just like this shooting. Uh, the fact that Congress can't, can't, uh, can't do away with guns. 
so that anybody who's deranged can go and get a gun and then kill other people. Uh, that call callousness is very troubling to me right now. And likewise, I think it's also true in the art too. And so even uh, PBS, I am I almost <coughs> don't want to to go in with their their uh, they're asking for money because they show such such disintegrative ideas on the screen and so likewise if you turn on any other station it's uh, all you see is is violence and so whatever is in the is in the mind that's what sacred art is that whatever's in the mind will con contribute toward your having faith. As a journey toward salvation or understanding. I think we have time for some questions, if any of you would like to ask it. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Yes. Uh, I can't. Can you speak I'll, a little? I'll, I'll repeat it for you. I'll repeat if it. Is, if there is a ballet lift that is done that is very efficient and refined and effortless, is it possible to think of it not as showmanship but as a, as a transcendent happening on a different level? Let, let me repeat that for the for the tape and for the audience and, and, and for Eric. If uh, let me see if I'm quoting you correctly, Angelic. If a ballet lift is done very efficiently and very beautifully without any obvious attempt to show off, right? Can it not express something beyond virtuosity? Of course. Of course, Balanchine at his best is like that. When he he is especially when he does something really special, uh, you can always tell that that's well, and that he had something in his mind. Beyond virtuosity. Oh well, he was. A, that was his great strength. I mean, for all the the codification of his of the style, he was a poet, and that made the difference. Let me just let me just explain. That's why Eric liked him for four years so much because he was a poet. Uh, um, after my years with Balanchine, then I started out to be a modern dancer. I think the first book I ever wrote, or ever read, on was Isidore Duncan's *The Art of the Dance*. I never knew. I didn't know there was until that winter. I didn't know there was such a thing as dancing on the stage. In Kansas City, a dance company no, in never New York, came. In New York, and uh, Isidora. Balanchine, he was a very, very wonderful man, but I knew in my heart that we had to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, because well, he was dealing with centuries of academic yes. um, but also it, discipline, yeah. and you wanted something fresher. Yes. And also the role of the man. After all, historically, the ballet grew up. He said ballet is woman, and so the man was always lifting this beautiful creature up and uh, who did become a metaphor in fact. yes of course of course no but 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 there wasn't quite that equalness well anyway the, uh, apropos of your question I'm just thinking uh, we had to go on and so that's what I've I've engaged my life to do are there any other questions yes right in the second row here first and then Lillian yeah I want to say one thing You mean this book? Yeah, moment by moment. Yeah, moment by moment. yeah well, that's that I, wonderful. I don't know if I can find. Yes, this is uh, Eric's words on time, experiencing time, moment by moment. Oh well. 
I believe, I believe in the possibility of a choreography of such immediacy that time could be sensed in its most difficult and yet most haunting dimension, time sensed instant by instant, a kind of time freed from space. Yes. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really feel like I can uh, live by that in terms of uh, <laughs> even doing things like contact improv, which you know, may not be necessarily in your genre, but I use it, I quote it to my students and I teach that. But yeah. actually, Well, let me just say for the tape that the question is about how the collaboration between Eric Hawkins and Lucid Lukashevsky proceeds on a practical level. And has it changed? Well, there are three possibilities uh, for anybody, um, music and dance. Uh, first of all, there's the idea, are you going to make them equal or is one going to be subservient to the other? And I think just on the side of morality, they have to be equal. <laughs> just they have to be equal. Uh, some of you who, who have degrees in dance probably have had inflicted on you uh, books by uh, Suzanne, oh, what's her name? Langer. Suzanne Langer, yeah, who was a, a brilliant woman in um, symbolic logic, but she also played the piano and taught at Connecticut College where there was a dance thing and decided that she was going to be an esthetician as well. And in it, she said that uh, it is possible to uh, have a beautiful dance to, a, to an indifferent piece of music. And then Clive Barnes, a lot of people have decided that that's all right. Well, that cotton in the ears, the idea is that if you're going to have an indifferent piece of music, for me, because my ears are always open, unless I put earplugs in them. When I go to the supermarket and all that music, I always put earplugs in so I, can't, I don't hear. But uh, when I go to a dance concert, my ears are very open. And if I see something beautiful on the stage and then hear this, this boring rattling around, uh, either on the tape or mostly it's on the tape, it tears down the beauty of the dance for me. So. I think that you can only have a beautiful dance with indifferent music or bad music or if you put earplugs in your ears, then, then you can do that. Lucy, it's impossible. I think one of the uh, uh, parts of this question was, does Eric make the dance and then you make the music? Well, uh, it, that's what, I, yeah, it? I was, yeah. It, it, so then there are the other possibilities. You can either have the choreographer choreograph in silence and then bring in a composer who will use that choreography as their, as their limit and create a, a score to it. Or you can, uh, or a choreographer, which is what usually happens, choreographer shops around and finds a piece of music that's been already written and does a dance to it. You can do it either way. Or a choreographer can commission a composer, as he did with Alan Hovannis, who wrote the music and then, and then Eric choreographed to it. Um, Either way is valid. The only problem over and over again is that, as I say, for me, they have to be equal. That means that each art form has to have a strong independence of its own. Now, there are choreographers and composers who feel that that's enough, that if they're just independent and, 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 and exist side by side, that's enough. For me, um, I think the added beauty morally, psychologically, as well as aesthetically, is if they sense one another moment by moment. Moment by moment, it's like a good relationship. You sense one another moment by moment, and yet you're independent. And that does not mean that you imitate one another. It does not mean that you, that one dominates the other. It just means that there's a constant sensing moment by moment. And, uh, for me, and I think I have done this probably more than any composer that I know, I, I think Eric and I, when we collaborated, we did create a kind of a new art form in the sense that I think that the thrill of hearing that sound while you're seeing that movement and that juxtaposition 
that is wordless. You don't even know why it's happening, but you put those two together and you get something third, something that's electric in between. I, that kind of sense of poetry I find very, very exciting. And I'm just finishing up now that new score for Eco Places where I'm doing just that. And so that hopefully, if you come in January and here, you will see and hear uh, this kind of two things happening at the same time, affecting one another, maintaining their independence, and creating a third excitement that uh, I, I can't comment on except it thrills me. I think we have maybe one more question. You had a question. Eric, what did you dance in that concert in the 40s here? What did you dance when you danced at the Y here? Stephen Acrobat? No, 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 earlier, no, earlier, earlier than that. Uh, no, I, I had this, I had a composer who, Ralph Gilbert, mm -hmm. who, who wrote my first four, uh, four of my dances. I called it the Liberty Tree. And it was a kind of, it was a kind of social comment but it wasn't just that. Um, and then I did a piece by Hunter Johnson uh, called Yankee Blue Birches. <laughs> and I don't remember what else I did. But Why did you do Trickster Coyote? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Trickster Coyote was done that. that with, with a wonderful composer by, called Henry Cowell. Yes. One of the fathers of contemporary... American and music. one of the composers who was very interested in working with dancers. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Doris Humphrey. Um, because it's still it, there is still a strange prejudice. You know, uh, Western music um, developed as much as it did, and Western dance did not develop as much as it did for that very reason about the status of the body. Because uh, Western music could could tell the authorities that it is bodiless, spiritual. It's no more spiritual than any other physical art form, but it doesn't it doesn't paint tables and chairs, so you don't see naive realistic objects. So it's invisible, so therefore it's spiritual. So it could get by getting into the churches, but a physical body, especially if it was being used, that was that was already going into the and so there's still colleges in our country that will not teach dance because I think they call it physical exercise or physical health education or something, but dance is still considered um, something that is not part of the spirit. Uh, just to finish off the question of how we work, I think it's very important, and we've done this in demonstrations, it'd be fun to do again, where you see the dance in silence, then you hear the music separately, and they're perfect entities in themselves. They really are perfect, and then you bring them together and you get this third wonderful thing happening. So, I think it's getting late, and we should, uh, there's one, oh, there's a desperate question back there. All right, it's, if it's... Well, they asked, is modern dance, remember George Beiswanger asked, is modern dance dead back in the, in the 40s already? And, and he was thinking that uh, one of the things that was going to happen was that modern dance and ballet were going to join forces, and, and they were both, as we knew them, going to disappear, which didn't happen. So I feel somewhat uh, 
uh, hopeful. I, I think that, that there are a lot of people who would rather look at dance than be exposed to ideas about dance. Uh, that um, for me, I always like to go hear people of uh, our leaders talk about what they, what they think behind dance. But many people don't want to hear talk. They want to look at, at people moving. I, what do you think, Eric? Why don't, is it, is, do you think there's an audience, a love for modern dance still? Since I came to New York in the 30s from college, I have, I, I, don't, I don't know that I'm, I'm honest in, in saying this or not, but I think there's been a very grave de a deterioration in the whole art scene. You're talking about painting as painting, well? Painting and in dancing. Um, and in composition. <coughs> Look, the New York Times <coughs> is taking seriously pop music. And I think it's beneath our contempt. Well, we need to, we need to, we need <laughs> The human spirit can, you can, because pop music is done, Plato in, in the Republic says, uh, as someone was going from the, one of his characters was going from the Piraeus down by the seashore up to Athens. And he said, I came along where some men who had been hanged were dumped in the ground. And I went over to look at them. I don't know why this is true. But some people choose the, the less good aspect of their life. I don't know why that's true, but some, some people will make a compromise, and so they will do it. They will do something for money, so they they think they can s sell something by doing some dancing that that makes a big hit. Likewise, in the in the music. Uh, so I, I don't. I hate to think this is true, but it looks as though America is on the downhill. Well, I, I have to say something about this. I think, um, I think any culture is, um, is going to stand or fall by all of us who are in it. And I think when we have um, media communication, it, 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 it is a great power, whether we like it or not. And I think we're very, very fortunate to have someone like Deborah because there, when there have been visionary people who have been, who, I, I'm sure she has an editor who will tell her this, that, and the other, or maybe she doesn't, but whatever. Uh, she has always, she has always opened herself up to a wide spectrum. She hasn't gotten caught into some, some corner, and she has always kind of fearlessly written eloquently over and over and over again. And she helps so much to mold that audience that's going to come. Now, if you think of pop music or pop dance or all, all the pop culture, because it, that is a financial enterprise, primarily, first, um, then so much money is spent on promoting all that that it is very hard for serious artists who are trying for something over and above money to compete with the kind of publicity that, that, say, a big rock concert can get. Now, why in God's name does Madonna do what she does? Because she knows that she's going to get a big crowd. She knows she's going to make the money. But there and and that, that, I don't mean that's her only reason, but that has to be a very important reason. And somehow we need, I was very fortunate in having, I, I was not, 
One of the reasons I wrote music for dance to this degree was that, that the, the, the official music world thought I was a crazy girl, that, that they weren't going to take any interest in. And Eric uh, thought what I was doing was beautiful. And so it gave me an outlet. So for 10 years, both the downtown crowd and the uptown crowd thought I was a little too crazy. And then after 10 years of working with Eric, Virgil Thompson heard some of my music and began to champion it. And it, it opened it all up in terms of official art. I was very fortunate in another way because I worked for 10 years egolessly because there was no one writing about me, there was no one particularly listening to me, and I was secretly, you know, this underground thing. But uh, the reason I mention this is that Virgil Thompson single-handedly, when he wrote for the Tribune, created a contemporary music culture. And, we, and Leighton is, is very good at that way, but he doesn't have as much, I don't know, uh, power. In any case, it takes those few individuals, once we have something like the media that is so powerful, uh, to, to have a visionary aspect of um, encouraging the audiences to come because there's there's nothing wrong this lady says why are there so few at dance concerts there are few too at contemporary music concerts there are almost none and then then the critics will come and say ah you see nobody comes to a contemporary music concert well if if madonna or michael jackson or whoever were ever publicized the way a typical contemporary music i i think there would be one or two people and so it, it, it's a problem and and uh, if in addition to the media those of us i came to new york in the 50s and it was a wonderful climate of artists, poets, dancers, and we all interrelated. I was, I was made a kind of mascot of the artist club that, that met on 8th Street because I was such a starry-eyed little kid then. And um, so it wasn't only the media. These people also had a visionary enthusiasm. And there are two ladies down there who have been part of that and have been visionary enthusiasts about these concerts. All it takes is all of us supporting this with enthusiasm and the young they'll follow they, 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 we learn that way I think that's part I think that's true I, I think I, I know that <coughs> when I have been excited about a beautiful piece of music or something and I tell everyone I know I am already contributing I think each of our individual enthusiasms plus someone like Deborah who's then in a, in a very powerful role as a writer, uh, if we just keep continuing that, it will not die. It will not die. I think on that note, we should end. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.